Good morning, friends. Come on in and stand with us, and we'll begin our worship service today. Sing our God and firm foundation. Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shaken, our forever in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Justice, you will reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. We our banner high, we lift the name of Jesus from age to age. You reign, your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high, we lift the name of Jesus from age to age. You reign, your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will 
sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to praise to glory. stand against and I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names but nothing can stand against and I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names but nothing can stand against oh yeah I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I Welcome to Green Ridge Baptist Church. If you're new here, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. We're excited that you chose to celebrate the Lord this morning with us. If you are new here, I want to invite you to scan that QR code that was on that little update that you walked in here with, and it'll take you to a spot where you can tell us a little basic info about yourself, and I'll send you a welcome email, and we really want to get in touch so we can know how we can serve you, how we can be praying for you, how we can help you get connected to the church. Here at Green Ridge, if you look at those banners, we are exiles exalting God and exerting good so our neighbors experience Jesus. That's what we want to be all about. That's what uh, we think the Lord has called us to. And so in a moment, I'm going to give you some uh, ways that you can be a part of that. Happy Fourth, everybody. Uh, I don't know if you've got big vacation plans or if you're just going to do a staycation and relax because VBS wiped you out. But whatever you are up to, we're praying for you. We know uh, maybe on the live stream we've got some friends and families that are out and maybe at the beach or doing their own thing. So we love you all and we pray for your safety over, over the weekend and the holidays. Um, a couple of announcements. If you are new here, we have a membership class coming up. It's starting next Sunday, July 10th, and it will meet at 11 o'clock. So if you're new here and you say, what is this church all about? What, why is it called Green Ridge and how long has it been here? What are its values? What does that exiles exalting God thing mean? If you're interested in that, go ahead and uh, sign up at greenridgebaptist.org slash events so we know to expect you. It'll be 11 o'clock. It's a four-week class and it's required for membership. So if you're interested, uh, follow up with that, please. Another thing that's going on, families. Hey, first, actually, before I talk about future family stuff and children's stuff, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our volunteers that made last week and the week before preschool VBS and elementary VBS possible. Thank you guys so much. You did an awesome job, awesome job. 
We had about 100 kids registered. I think we had between like 85 and 95 on most of the days, and it was just a blast. My favorite part of VBS is that I would walk through the church and overhear little kids going, Ace Warburton, Master Spy, and I just thought, yep, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, there it is. There's some excitement over there. Um, Hey, we, uh, we have some opportunities for families and uh, especially families with little kids. There's a family picnic coming up on July 6th. It's Wednesday at 6 p.m. at Black Hills Park. Um, I don't see any sign-up information on there. Double-check the church website, see if you need to sign up. But if there's nothing there, just show up. Just show up, and it'll be a blast. Um, the other thing is we've got uh, some collection drives that we need your help with. Clarksburg can. Uh, is collecting food. There's, there's a list available. It's right there. They need bottles of juice, crackers, hamburger helper, box. Okay, I'm not going to read it all. You can find out more, and you can uh, bring stuff in here to the church to help with that pantry ministry. And then we're also collecting things for, uh, for schools. We're doing a school drive, and uh, we're, we're getting things ready now, so we have things when school kicks back off. So you can find out more about that at greenridgebaptist.org slash school. One last thing. If you want to prove that you are a macho, manly man, if you want to show off the biceps a little bit, we need a lot of guys right after this service to report to the sanctuary because we need to move a piano. Two and pianos. Th two, pianos? two pianos? Oh, dear. We need <laughs> everyone who has even, even like a centimeter bicep, please help Goodness I wanna, gracious. I don't want to give you the bait and switch and think you got one uh, piano yeah. when you actually got two pianos. That's like telling so. a kid, come to my sports camp, and they show up, it's Bible camp. Um, <laughs> my first week here at Green Ridge, I was asked to move two pianos as like other duties as assigned. And then I, the next few months, I herniated a disc. I wonder what... <laughs> Not correlated. Know. Not related. Goodness. I think, I think I'm done. Uh, hey... One of our elders is going to come and pray, lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Um, please stand, and as we pray, you can hold your hands out in a posture of, uh, a posture of prayer and a posture of reception to what the Lord is going to do. Yes, good morning. I'm Peter Sprigg. I'm one of the elders here at Green Ridge, and uh, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him how to pray. Many of you learned this, uh, particular versions growing up, you're free to say it that way, or even in a language other than English, if that's uh, more comfortable to you or if that's how you first learned it. I will read it as in the more modern translation we have on the screen. Please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sing, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat.
rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you. Our scripture passage this morning is John 3, 16 through 17, and if you can repeat that with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You may be seated, church. Church, it's our habit, our practice on first Sundays to, to participate in the Lord's Supper, to receive communion together. And really what this is about is what our sister Ada just read for us. God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so that through him he could save the world. He loved us to the point of death on a cross. If that is what it cost God to save us, to rescue us from sin, he said, I am willing to pay that price. And so the Son of God took on flesh and went to a cross, where on that cross, our sin was put on him, and it was nailed to the cross with him. And as he died, he put our sin to death to make a way for us to be forgiven, to make a way for us to be saved, healed, and then, not only that, three days later, he rose from the grave. He conquered death for us so that in him we might have eternal life as well. And so what we do with this this symbol, with this habit that we have that 
that tr Christians all around the world today, this morning, are celebrating with us. What a cool thought. What we do with this is we remember the Lord's death for us, and we give thanks, and we celebrate, and we also take a moment to be somber, to confess, to reflect, to recognize it was our sin that put him on that cross in his great love for us. And so we, we take a moment and we, we're going to examine our hearts and say, Lord, is there anything? Search me. Is there anything that you would have me repent of? Is there anything I need to apologize to you or to my spouse or to my children or to my parents about? Is there anything that I need to say, you know what, that I need to put that to death with Christ on the cross and walk in newness of life. Is there anything, Lord? Search me and help me. That's what we mean by confession and, and reflection. And so uh, I'm going to invite us to a time of reflection and confession. And you'll, you'll come forward. You'll receive the bread and the cup. Uh, we're still working on our little traffic jam scenario. So we're going to move wherever you are. You move to the innermost aisle. You move inward, and then you come down. So you guys are going to move in and come down, and then you go that way and back. And we'll see if this works. And try not to shoulder check anyone. They're your brother or sister in Christ. The bread reminds us of the body of Christ broken for us. And just as bread nourishes our body, we need his sacrifice to give life to our souls. And the cup reminds us of the blood of Jesus spilled for us. And just as water and drink gives us life, so we need the blood of Christ to have life. And so we take them remembering what he's done for us. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and, and do the work of confession, do the work of reflection, and just ask the Lord, search me, Lord. Is there anything I need to repent of now? Lord God, in this moment, we do pray that you would search us and that we would be receptive to your spirit. We freely, quickly admit that each of us is a sinner. Each of us has things to repent of, to change, to surrender to you, to turn from. We're so grateful that it's not our work of repentance. It's not our work of being good enough that gets us forgiven or earns us your love. It is your gracious love poured out on us sinners through Christ. It is the work that Jesus completed at the cross and in his resurrection. It is that work that saves us. We rest in that assurance, but God, we know that you call us to live like Christ now, to live out that new life. And so, God, we, again, humble ourselves before the cross we say we are sinners in need of grace. We know that we can be healed if you but say the word, and we are so grateful that you have spoken that word, yes and amen, through Jesus at his cross. Help each of us now to receive communion, receive the bread and the cup with grateful hearts as we turn and focus on Christ. And God, help us this week. Whatever you've shown us, whatever you've laid on our hearts to deal with and to make right, I pray that you would help us by your spirit to follow through, to repent, to do what we need to do. Make us more like Jesus. We want to live that way. That's where life and freedom are found. God, we pray now that you would help us to receive with grateful and worshipful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, at this time, come forward. And you'll take the elements when you get back to your seats on your own. Take them on your own.
Heavenly Father, we, we could never express how, how grateful we are for what you've done for us in Christ. The freedom, the forgiveness that you purchased for us at the cross is a debt we could never, ever, ever even think to repay. But we love you, God. Help us to love you more. Help us to walk with you. Help us to repent in all the ways that you've called us to. Lord, we pray now as Ada plays this, this music that you would help us to sit in reflection, to be worshipful, to prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is our program for fifth graders on down. If you are new here and your kids are not checked in, you can get up and kind of take them over now and do that. If you're new here and you just want to spy on what our KPW program is like, you are welcome as parents to head down there. Just introduce yourselves to a teacher and uh, try not to glare at any of the children, okay? Um, Let's pray for our kids, and we'll also pray for any offering that we take up this, uh, this week so that the ministry can continue going, and we're going to pray for Pastor Paul as well. Lord God, we lift up these children to you, and we pray that you would help, uh, help their hearts to be receptive this morning to what you want to teach them. God, I pray that they would learn both through the lessons and the games 
and just the way that their teachers and volunteers care for them. God, I pray that they would see the example of Jesus in these volunteers. I pray you would help the volunteers to do that. I think some of them are, are pretty beat from VBS. Give them energy, give them patience, give them joy. And Lord, I pray that you would teach them through the Bible stories and, and memor memory verses and all of the things that are going on. We pray that seeds of faith would be planted and watered this Sunday and all of their Sundays, that you would help these children to grow to have a firm foundation of faith in Christ. We pray for uh, their future, Lord, that you would prepare them now to be young men and women of Christ who make a great impact in this world as they love and serve and share in Jesus' name. God, we pray for the offering that we take up today through the box over there and through digital gifts. And Lord, we pray that you would use it and multiply it. We pray that our gifts would be pleasing to you, that you would help us to give sacrificially and generously so that the work of the ministry can be done. God, we pray that you would continue to provide. We know that you are our true provider, and every gift we receive comes through your gracious hand, through the hands of your people. Lord, we pray for Pastor Paul now that you would speak through him, that you would give him clarity, that you would help him to be bold in the way that he teaches from your word. God, we pray that you would help him to be faithful to your word, and Lord, we pray for ourselves that you would help us to listen well as we seek to hear from you and seek to put into practice the things that your word teaches us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, friends. Uh, my name is Paul. I am one of the pastors here. I like to say I am the baldest pastor here. We are in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, so go ahead and grab your copy of the scriptures and turn there. If you are joining us for the first time this week, or maybe for the first time in a while, we are working our way through the book of Genesis. And the story arc that we're dealing with right now is all about Abraham. The, the focus for this story arc has been, the con has been on the concepts of faith and fear in Abraham's life. And one of the things that we've talked about is that faith and fear aren't innately good or bad. Fear is a good thing when it's directed toward God, but a bad thing when it's directed at something that's not God. We should fear God. The scriptures tell us to fear God. It's good to fear God. His power and justice are terrifying. We should fear him with the understanding that he's also good. The same is true about faith, or we could use the word trust here. Faith or trust is a good thing when it's directed toward God, but it's a bad thing when it's directed at anything that's not God. We should trust God because He's faithful. We should place our faith in Him alone because He's the only one who always keeps His promises. These are the things that the life of Abraham is teaching us. But what we see in our text today is that, is that faith and fear don't necessarily take away all of the worries of life. Faith and fear don't necessarily cure us of all of our worries or stress. And I think that most, most of us, probably all of us, have felt this, have lived with this idea at one time or another. We love Jesus. We're in community with other believers. We're engaged in some kind of discipleship. We're serving. We're doing all of the stuff that Christians are supposed to do. But even with all of that, the worries of life can still weigh us down. Money's tight. You've got bills to pay. Your diagnosis is scary. Or maybe worse, unknown. You keeping your job is hanging in the balance by something that's out of your control. There's crazy economic stuff happening, like, like a baby formula shortage. We could keep going and going, right? The everyday grind of life in a world wrecked by sin produces worry after worry and stress after stress. 
even for the follower of Jesus. But you want to know what makes this even more difficult? It's that some of us have been taught that faith is supposed to be some kind of magic pill that cures us of worrying. We've heard that if we just believed more, we wouldn't worry. And if we're worrying, then we know that we don't have enough faith. You ever heard that? So we, as followers of Jesus, are stressed out and worried by some really heavy stuff in life. And then we have the added burden that if we actually feel any of that worry or any of that stress, we're not Christian enough. Church, today I want to push back on some of that. I want to offer a different way to think about the relationship between worry and stress and faith and fear. Instead of faith and fear being some kind of magic pill that's supposed to cure you of all of your worry and stress, I want us to think about faith and fear as the boat that's supposed to carry you across the worry and the stress. It's not that faith and fear make it so you never worry or you never stress. It's that faith and fear make it so that you can endure the worry and get to the other side of the stress. Faith in a God who saves gives you hope in a better future, and that helps you weather the storm of worry. Fear in a God who is more powerful than your situation gives you hope that whatever stress this is, it's not too much to overwhelm you because you belong to Him. And what this means is that in the worry and in the stress, in the moments of doubt, in the moments of struggle, God has given us the gift of faith. And the gift of fear to help us endure all of that stuff. To get us to the other side. To give us hope. So the big idea that we want to unpack today is that when life has you worried and stressed, choose faith and fear. When life has you worried and stressed, choose faith and fear. There are three things in Abraham's story today that will help us understand what choosing faith and fear looks like. So as we start with chapter 17 today, there are a few things we need to remember before we dive in. Way back in chapter 12, that's where the story of Abraham starts, we learn that Abram was 75 years old when God first called him. Abram was 75 years old when God first started making promises to him about blessing and children and a land and all of that stuff. 75. When chapter 17 starts, five chapters later, we hear that Abram is now 99 years old. Abram's been waiting for the things that God promised him for over 25 years. Think about that. 25 years, 25 years of stress and worry about how God is going to do all of the stuff that he said he was going to do. And let's be honest, okay? Don't be offended. Abram and Sarai were kind of old when God started making promises to them. And they're just getting older and older and older For Abram and Sarai, the window of opportunity looks like it is closing fast for God to do everything that he said he was going to do. And that brings some stress and worry, right? The family line is at stake. The family property is at stake. Everything that Abram has worked for and built up and everything that he's hoped for because God's promises, all of that stuff is hanging by a thread. And Abram knows it, and Sarai knows it, stress and worry. Second thing I want us to recall is that God has already had two moments of covenant conversations with Abram. The first one was back in chapter 12 when he first called them, and the other one was in chapter 15. Today, God's going to have another covenant conversation with Abram, but it's going to be a little different. So, so here's what God already promised Abram in the covenants that, that came before. Back in chapter 12, God said that he would make Abram a great nation. 
God would bless him and make his name great. He will be a blessing and all of the nations of the earth will be blessed through him and that his family is going to get this land that he was on. That's in chapter 12. In chapter 15, God said that all of that blessing and all of that land and stuff was going to to go through one of his own sons and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. So so now I'm going to read some chunks of chapter 17, and I want you to look for places where the covenant looks a little different. From what God has said here, in chapter 17, things look a little different. Look at chapter 17, starting in verse 4. This is God speaking. Behold, my covenant is with you, Abram. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Jump down to verse 15. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations, kings of peoples shall come from her. Look at verse 18. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. All right. Do you see any differences between what came before and what comes here? Here are the things that I noticed. In chapter 17, Abram is now going to be the father of a multitude of nations. Earlier, it was just one nation. And that's where the name change comes in. Abram to Abraham. Here in chapter 17, God says that kings will come from his line. We haven't heard that before. He says that the promise is going to come from a son of Sarah. He hadn't specified that earlier. And that the son to be born will be called Isaac. And that the covenant will pass through him. uh, God says he's also going to bless Ishmael. uh, But the promise is going to pass through Isaac. The thing that I want us to notice with, with this comparison here between these chapters is that most of what God is saying here is really in response to the bad decision that Abraham and Sarah made with Hagar. Why nations now instead of nation? Well, he's got two sons that are coming up. Ishmael, God says he's going to bless Ishmael and he will be nations, but Isaac is the one that the promise will pass through, and so he's going to be a nation as well. Why does God have to clearly point out that Sarah will be the one to have the son of promise? The covenant's going to pass through that child. Why did God have to specify that? It's because Abraham and Sarah tried to make God's promise come true on their own by forcing Hagar into the mix. One of the big things that I think God is doing here with this covenant conversation is that he's saying... Guys, you messed up back there. I told you the plan earlier. I told you that that I've got this. You don't have to worry about it. I told you that I have everything under control. But Abraham and Sarah, you didn't trust me. You didn't fear me. You tried to get there with your own plans. But we're not going to do what you want to do, God says. We're going to do what I want to do. And you need to be reminded of that. When God affirms the covenant with Abraham here in Genesis 17, one of the things he's doing is he's calling him, calling him out for his sin. God's saying, look, I disagree with your decisions back there. That's our first point today. When life has you worried and stressed, choose faith and fear by hearing. Hearing how God disagrees. Abraham and Sarah are worried and stressed about all of these unmet promises. They're worried and stressed about their household and their property. And back in the day, that worry and stress made them do something sinful 
with Hagar. But God's telling them that those promises haven't changed. And now they have a choice to make. They could choose again to try to take matters into their own hands. They could choose to try to carve out their own path and try to make things work with their own plans. Or they could choose to really listen to what God is saying. They could choose to really hear from God that the path that they walked down before was actually stupid and arrogant. And they could choose today to trust God. They could choose to trust Him and fear Him this time around. Church, I think we've all done stupid things when we've been worried and stressed. When life has weighed us down, I think we've all tried to figure things out on our own, even if that meant doing something that we know God hates. And we've either seen it backfire and we regret it, or maybe worse, we've seen it succeed. But in our hearts, we know that God hated how we succeeded. Friends, I don't know what kind of stress and worry you brought in the doors with you today and i don't know what kind of options you're considering to deal with that stress and worry but i want to urge you by the holy spirit from the scriptures of god i want to urge you to choose faith in your god choose to fear your god Open your heart and open your mind to really hear how God disagrees with any of those sinful options you might be considering for your stress and worry. Search the scriptures and really hear from God about what's good and right and what's sinful and destructive and choose faith. Choose the fear of God by really hearing how the truth of God disagrees with those sinful actions. Let's keep going today. Chapter 17, look at verse 9. God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Gross alert. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. I feel like I always get the fun passages. (laughs) Let's be honest, this is gross to talk about, okay? And I'm not going to go into any detail about circumcision. If you have a question about circumcision, you can ask your doctor or whatever you want to do. But we should ask, what in the world is going on here, (laughs) right? Why did God ask Abraham to do this? Why did he ask him to do this, right? There's a lot of other things that we can think of. In verse 24, (laughs) man, think about this. In verse 24, it says that Abraham was 99 years old when he got circumcised. Yikes. That sounds terrible. What's God doing here? Well, he uses the word sign here, right? This is going to be a sign of the covenant. Remember when we talked uh, about the rainbow and the flood back with Noah. God said that, that the rainbow was going to be a sign for Noah and his family and everybody else. It was going to be a sign of the covenant that God made. Whenever they saw the rainbow in the sky, they were supposed to think, oh, God made a covenant with us, right? That rainbow was to remind us of the covenant that God had made. And it's the same thing here. God said that circumcision is going to be the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham and his family. Right? What's what's the covenant? I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing. You're going to get this land. You're going to have all these descendants. The sign of the covenant is circumcision. And again, it's a little gross, but, but bear with me, right? Every time after circumcision that the men of Abraham's household uh, and, and eventually all the people of Israel, all the men of Israel, every time they do some everyday tasks, they will see the sign of the covenant that God made with their people. Every time they go to the bathroom, right? Every time they change their underwear. 
Every day, multiple times a day, the men of Israel will be reminded that they belong to God and God belongs to them. Gross. But meaningful when we stop and think about it. So God says, I want you to do this. You and and all your household, all the men in your household. So how does Abraham respond? Look at verse 22. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. Whoa! Can we talk about this a little bit before, before we start doing that stuff? The only word I can think of to describe Abraham's obedience here is drastic, (laughs) right? This is drastic obedience. The man is 99 years old, and he has a few hundred men that are a part of his household. And I don't think God gets embarrassed or beats around the bush, but when I hear this conversation, I I feel like I hear God saying, So, uh, Abe, I, uh, bear with me. I want you and all your men to, uh, make some adjustments you know where. And Abraham's response is, yes, sir, I'll do it right now. Right? Drastic obedience. He doesn't say, whoa, God, let's talk this through. Right? He doesn't take a poll of the men in his household. I'm pretty sure that would have been really bad. God says, do this. And Abraham does it immediately. Second point today is when life has you worried and stressed, choose faith and fear by doing what God says. When life has you worried and stressed, choose faith and fear by doing what God says. Look, church, God isn't taking away any of Abraham's stress and worry here. Listen, if anything, he's adding to it with the whole circumcision stuff. Yeah, God's reaffirming his promises. But Abraham's been hearing God's promises for 25 years, and he's still waiting. The stress and worries that Abraham and Sarah have been carrying, they're still carrying it when God leaves after the conversation. They're still feeling the pressure of waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled, but in the middle of the stress and worry of waiting for things that God says will happen in the future, God gave something for Abraham to do today, and Abraham does it. He chose to have faith in God. He chose to fear God by being obedient to what God told him to do, even in the middle of worry and stress and waiting. Church, some of the things that you are worrying about today are important. They matter. And you may have to be thinking about them for a long time. Some of those things aren't going to be resolved overnight. But listen, while you're waiting, even in the worry and the stress, choose faith and fear. Choose to be obedient to God. You know, there are situations where we do need to wait on God to to give us guidance, right? Sometimes we do need to wait for Him to open a door of opportunity or close a door so that we know what decision we should make. But friends, even in those moments of waiting, God is not silent. It's funny how often Satan tricks us into forgetting that God is always speaking to us through His Word, God is always communicating loud and clear in the Bible. And I'm not just talking about how salvation works or the Trinity or stuff like that. I'm talking about real concrete commands that we can obey today. Things like Micah 6.8, right? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I love Romans 12 because it's got all kinds of stuff for us. Bless those who persecute you. You can do that today. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. You can do that today. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. More of us need to obey that command. 
Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That's stuff that you can do right now. Look, you may be waiting on God to give you guidance on what to do about this or that situation, but He's given you commands to do in the meantime, even in the midst of the worry and stress of waiting. You may not be sure what your next step is with your job. Do you keep the job you have? Do you look for a new job? You don't know yet, and you're waiting for God's guidance, but you can still choose to love your coworkers well. You may be waiting on God to help you sell your house or get a loan or pay off that debt. But while you're waiting for him, you can still build ways to share the gospel with your neighbors. You can still reject pride in conversation with your family members. You can still share the gospel with your classmates. When life has you worried and stressed, choose faith. Choose fear. By doing what God says. Then when we get into chapter 18, the story shifts a little bit. It shifts to Abraham and Sarah hanging out in their tent. And then three dudes walk up. And the Bible says that the Lord, God, is one of those dudes, but in disguise. I don't know that Abraham and Sarah know it's, it's him for a while. And because Abraham is super hospitable, he and Sarah fix up a meal, a big meal for them. And the dudes sit down and eat and have lunch, and Abraham acts as their waiter, and Sarah's like eavesdropping at the door of their tent. Look at chapter 18, verse 9. And they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She's in the tent. He said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have this pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? And say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. Again, I'm not sure if Abraham and Sarah know that God is talking to them here. It kind of feels like they don't know that. But they still hear that God is going to do this thing for them that He's been promising over the last 25 years. They're still hearing about God's promises and goodness and provision and grace. And at this point in her life, Sarah is 90. She's wanted a baby her whole life. She wants the family line carried on. And she's been promised these things. And she even tried out an idea with Hagar that she thought was a good plan, but that ended up being pretty crummy in the end. She's worried and stressed. Life is weighing on her. And here are these three guys who, I think, to her, look like total strangers. And they have the gall to reaffirm God's promise to Abraham and Sarah one more time. And in her worry and distress, in her waiting and frustration, she laughs. I think out of doubt. She laughs with doubt when she hears the promise yet again. Our last point today is this. When life has you worried and stressed, choose faith and fear by pushing through your doubts. Pushing through your doubts. Church, we're going to have doubts. Unbelief is going to be something that hits your heart and your mind from time to time. You're going to hear about God's promises in a sermon or about His goodness in a song. And you might just want to laugh with doubt along with Sarah. You might think, man, I'm still waiting to experience all of that stuff in my life. Is God ever going to show up? Is He ever going to resolve this situation that I'm living in? One of the things I want you to see with, with Abraham and Sarah is that that reaction is very human. 
It's natural for those of us who live in this world wrecked by sin to feel that way sometimes. Abraham felt that way. Sarah felt that way. I felt that way. Because of the sin-filled world we live in, it makes sense to have doubts. But it also makes sense to push through those doubts. Why? Because you know that your God is faithful. You know that He's true. You know that He loves you. How do you know that? Because you've seen Him love you before. Look, Abraham and Sarah... They're sitting in this, this doubt and this frustration and this waiting, but they've been watching God provide for them and protect them for 25 years. They've seen the goodness of God. They know what He's capable of. And my doubting friends, you've seen the goodness of God. You know what He's capable of. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, just, just push Satan's lies away from your mind for a minute and remember all the times that God has cared for you. How He's provided for you. How He's given you exactly what you needed at exactly the right time. And, and for real, that may be too hard for you, and, and I understand that. But all you need to do, if, if it's too hard for you to dig back in your memories and find those things, all you need to do is look at the Word of God and then look at the cross. The Word of God promised that your sins would be paid for in full and that a way would be opened for your relationship with God to be fully restored. That's what the Word of God promised you. And now, the cross of Jesus Christ stands as the sign that that was a promise given and a promise kept. God sent Jesus to die for you, to pay for your sins, and Jesus rose from the dead to prove that he did it. And that is one huge historical promise that God has kept for you. And it leaves no doubt that God loves you. And that he fiercely fights for your good. This worry and stress and doubt that you're fighting with today is understandable. I don't minimize it. I don't sweep it under the rug. But God has demonstrated in the past that He is for you. And you can trust that He will be for you in the future. Push through your doubts. Choose to trust God. Choose to fear Him. Choose that He will be your God and you will be His people. Church, it's not that faith and fear make it so you never worry or stress. It's that faith and fear make it so that you can endure the worry and endure the stress. Faith in a God who saves gives you hope in a better future that helps you weather the storm of worry. Fear in a God who is more powerful than your situation gives you hope that whatever this stress is, it's not too much to overwhelm you because you belong to Him. When life has you worried and stressed, choose faith and fear by hearing how God disagrees, by doing what He says, and by pushing through your doubts. Church, stand with me and let's pray together. Lord God, we are thankful for the Word of God that teaches us these things. We're thankful, God, that You have always been faithful and You will continue to be faithful. God, in our doubts, in our worries, in our stress, in our waiting, help us to choose to trust you, to have faith in you. Help us to choose to live in the good fear of you. Father, I pray a blessing over my brothers and sisters this week, that all of us would choose faith and fear. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I invite you to hold your hands out in a posture of reception as I read this benediction over you from Psalm chapter 5. Let all who take refuge in you, O God, rejoice. 
Let them ever sing for joy and spread, O God, your protection over them that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. Church, go and seek your refuge in God this week. You're dismissed.